Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's panel discussion on consumer protection in digital lending as part of the digital lending watchdog. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Cashless Consumer is a consumer collective working on digital payments. We've also been studying uh, digital credit since digital payments and uh, digital credit are almost conjoint twins. Most notably, we did some extensive work documenting the digital lending crisis uh, that happened in India, which included a dozen suicides in late 2020 uh, under killer loan apps. The RBI uh, formed a working group on digital lending, uh, including lending through online platforms and mobile apps. Uh, subsequently, the working group made its report public in November 2021, and RBI has sought public feedback. The RBI is expected to come up with a formal regulation on digital lending, and it is in this context that we are having this discussion today. Cashless Consumer will be tracking the digital lending space a bit more closely through the Digital Lending Watchtower project, and we'll have a series of conversations, reports to unpack the complexities of digital lending and bring up issues of consumer interest in digital lending. In today's panel, uh, we look at consumer protection and digital lending, both from what has been discussed in the RBI Working Group report and beyond it. We are joined by an esteemed panel of practitioners who have been a key stakeholder in this space. Uh, let me introduce the panelists for the discussion today. Uh, Aarti Singh is a Deputy Editor of Fintech at Mint and has extensively reported on the Indian fintech space with deeply research stories. Bini Chub manages research at Future of Finance Initiative Dwara Research. Her work focuses mainly on uh, identifying systemic stability and consumer protection concerns in digital finance. Prasanto Roy is a public policy consultant and a veteran technology journalist, writer, and speaker on tech and policy issues. Ravi Setia is founder of Udar, a fintech startup that provides technology platform for financial institutions to lend digitally and drive financial inclusion. Before we start, a uh, couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, we'll, we'll have a set of remarks by the panelists and followed by questions. And once we're done with that, we'll take questions from YouTube chat and uh, have a discussion with, with the panel. Uh, so uh, without much ado, I'll uh, let uh, the panel get started. Uh, so. Uh, uh, who wants to go first with opening set of remarks? I think Ravi should go. <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, uh, no, because he's from the industry player, right? So we all need to hear like him, what he has to say, and then just a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. Thanks for that opportunity as well. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, very good evening. Uh, uh, so we have been working uh, in this fintech space for a quite while. Personally, I have been involved through 2015. And we always had this goal of uh, trying to drive financial inclusion. And we've been on it uh, through a mix of technology solutions and under some understanding of finance. Primarily, I come from a technology background. Uh, the RBI's report and, and the whole uh, uh, issue that happened, especially in 2020 with a lot of loan apps coming in, uh, was good to see that there's some action being taken because there was a mess that was created in 2020 and it needed it was time that probably we needed some sort of uh, regulatory oversight to come in not action as of now uh, as a fintech startup uh, we have always been at this intersection where there are swords of regulation always hanging over right 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 from rbi to Aadhaar regulation and and uh, since we've been in the industry from 2015, we have seen it kind of all uh, that, okay, always there is whether Aadhaar will be usable or not, whether RBI will come up with FLDG blocking or not. So whenever we mention FinTech, I think regulation plays a key role in that. And probably if we talk about PIN plus tech plus innovation, regulation is the fourth pillar of FinTech in any country. Uh, with consumer lending, it's probably at the uh, highest uh, uh, manifestation where regulation comes in for any country. So it was good to see that uh, RBI had formulated a group and then they came up with reports. Some of those findings, um, uh, uh, as they have said that they want to regulate because there are so many apps being created which was unanticipated, right? People probably even as a FinTech startup, I, I used to track all these apps and okay, up to 500 number 
I used to track 20, 2018 or so, but 2019, 20, it had just blown up. And every combination of the word cash, rupee, money you apply will create a new mobile app probably on loan apps. And that is what was happening. And that had created a lot, lot of lack of trust in the consumer's mind where they were like, okay, we continue to jump from app to app or which app to download and advertising especially played a big role in this, uh, which is where the likes of video commerce platforms right from TikTok and others were also being leveraged for all this advertising apart from the traditional Facebook, Google one. So it was probably the right time uh, that uh, uh, RBA should have woken up in that sense from 2020 or 2021. So good that the report came in. Uh, but again, as a FinTech startup, if, if we had to look at saying that, okay, if today I have to start uh, a FinTech startup again, and I have all these regulations coming into the uh, foray right from the start, it becomes very tricky. Uh, which one do you obey, right? There's regulation from Google's end. There's regulation from RBI's end. There are obviously other data IT related ones that, that a uh, startup has to follow. So probably it had always to be in a manner where it's like scale-based. Uh, okay, if a startup is small or uh, or a startup is not dealing with significant volumes and the regulation is low touch, if it is higher volumes, it should be uh, uh, like the uh, 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 stricter regulations will apply. So the as of now, how the report looks to me is uh, obviously they have called for an SRO format uh, to be adopted. Uh, Personally, it feels like it might be better because RBI cannot take up the load that is going to come up because FinTech is going to grow like immensely. And maybe RBI may not have a formal department there. And that's why they are asking for this SROs to be created from an industry-led body perspective. And maybe that will provide low touch uh, uh, mechanism for regulation. But the concern again remains, will it become kind of a lobbying uh, body as well? Uh, because it happens at times that People who are not in those circles don't get access to information or few things that are happening and like there's an unfair or a information arbitrage that comes in. Uh, that is one thing to be worried about. Rest, I think uh, we obviously need more of discussions as of now. And I think we also ourselves miss submitting feedback uh, to RBI on the report. Uh, uh, but, but I think a wider consultation would help us. So I think we are on track. And in 2022, we should have probably better norms that will make consumer lending safer in India while it grows multifold. Okay, so uh, yeah, the focus has been like safer. So that, that word safe kind of gets more significant, especially after the uh, events that unfolded in 2020. Uh, uh, so I want to uh, bring in Benny next. Uh, so Benny, as somebody who's been studying uh, financial inclusion and consumer protection, uh, especially for, let's say, the uh, underserved uh, population, which is, again, uh, there is a large uh, set of overlap between what is the target uh, market of the digital credit industry and uh, the populations that you've been involved in studying. What are the some of the uh, key consumer protection concerns uh, that you think are, uh, and how have they been dealt in the RBI report? I suppose there's some things off with my camera, and that was definitely not how I planned to start my comments. But um, to uh, Shrikant, your point, I think. Um, I, I just want to kind of take a step back and uh, just say that just after the report was released and even after the submission deadline of the 31st December, we've seen a couple of developments coming from the RBI. So I think that the report itself does not perhaps give us a complete picture of uh, the RBI's road plan. Uh, the two key developments that I want to call out here is the access to uh, CICs by, let's say, what we colloquially call fintechs. Um, and uh, I, I want to flag that one as important because the report gave us a very 
uh, I, I'd say a very contrasting impression of what the RBI had on its mind in terms of fintech's access to CIC, because the report go, uh, went on to say that fintechs could not access credit information or pink credit information companies uh, because that was leading to a lot of uh, violations of sensitive personal data, which the reports typically carry. And just after that announcement, and a couple of days later, I want to say the last week, they came up with a small amendment with the credit information companies regulations and they said that actually uh, regulated entities could uh, sorry uh, fintech entities could uh, get access to cic's if they got an approval from the credit information company themselves and had a stipulated amount of capital so on so forth uh, i bring in all of the details which perhaps will also come in later in the conversation but only to say that we might not want to take the report at the face uh, at face value and there is more going on perhaps that we are more than we, what we are aware of. The second big development in the same vein was the creation of the fintech department, uh, which kind of also speaks to Ravi's point that uh, currently it seemed that we might not have had a lot of fintech specific expertise within the RBI or at least a dedicated cell that was working on it. But the coming of fintech department definitely gives us all something to look at. Uh, so just to preface whatever I'm going to say about the report, that it could well be the case that there's a lot more going on on the RBI side that we're, what we're aware of. But strictly speaking about the report itself, then coming back to your question, what are the concerns or what are the typical consumer protection risks that we know exist? Uh, then Dwara Research has been working on consumer protection for the last 12, 13 years. Uh, we, we sit at the intersection of consumer protection and financial inclusion. And our experience basically tells we've created an internal typology of consumer protection risks, really. Uh, the first one would be uh, consumer protection risks that come from unsuitable products. And those would be products that are largely designed to be unsuitable uh, either uh, so either they're designed to be unsuitable one example is of investment come insurance products we know that investment and insurance when decoupled work better as products but when you make a combination you end up being underinsured and underinvested so those are some products that we know are globally unsuitable where the design itself is imperfect and that's of course one consumer risk uh, the second kind of consumer risk is then um, i would say conduct of the service provider or the financial service provider, which leads to suboptimal financial choices. So what I mean by that is when the disclosure instruments are not designed properly, when there is information asymmetry between the seller of the product and the buyer of the product, that also leads to consumer risks because consumers do not, let's say, for instance, understand what is the annualized percentage rate of the loan. And they just make a decision based on monthly rates, which obviously is 12 times lesser. And therefore, um, you know, when, when when payments are due, they find themselves in a very different situation than the one they had expected at the time of contracting. So that's the second kind of thing, uh, consumer risk, risk that emerges when there is information asymmetry. The third kind of consumer risk that we know of now, and I would say is more specific to digital loans as opposed to, let's say, uh, telephonically provided loans or uh, loans provided in person, and that is the deployment of dark patterns. And what that means is that your screen has been created and the choice architecture has been created in a way which makes you, which nudges you towards a choice which is uh, typically not in your own self-interest, but in the interest of the lender. In India, we have been trying to track some of these cases. We haven't got a lot in terms of digital lending, but one example that definitely does come to mind was the case of uh, buying travel tickets. For those of us who have used, uh, for instance, travel portals, we've always found that we were by default given a travel insurance and we had to check out of that travel insurance if we didn't want it. So that's basically a choice architecture that's working again against the consumer because we know that checking out uh, of a box is less common than checking in and the, uh, sorry checking in is less common than uh, so basically what uh, a short point to say that if you have to actively check in you're applying more brain but if the default option is checked in then it's highly unlikely that you would actually notice that and check out so those are dark patterns so this is just one kind of risk but of course there are other kinds of risks in finance we are typically as consumer advocates not so worried about micro prudential risk insofar at least 
it leads for an uh, for a let's say a lender to fail we worry about micro prudential risks when they also become consumer protection problems this is the case that we saw in kenya where just to kind of improvise on algorithms lots of people were given very small ticket loans which they were necessarily not eligible for and what happened was an on mass default by those uh, lend uh, by those borrowers which was a consumer protection concern because then they were blacklisted in formal credit registries they could not get access uh, formal loans for the next two years so we are not so worried about uh, the lender facing a loss but when the lenders malpractices or lenders misjudgments then a kind of manifest in consumer protection risks that becomes problematic so that i would call out that as the second category of uh, uh, consumer protection risk which which are typically micro prudential in nature but have an implication for consumer protection and this is where i would put the whole uh, discussion account around algorithms glass box or black box whatever you or however you want to look at the problem but um, the whole problem for, problem of algorithm fits in there because uh, essentially, these algorithms get better only when they serve more and get more data. And there is that training period, which then kind of makes people more vulnerable to defaults than they would have otherwise been had the algorithm been matured. That's the second kind of category. The third kind of category is, um, in some sense, the technological vulnerability um, that comes with now increasingly digital lenders and this is these are the cases that we've seen in china especially with the payments group that some players become too large and then any vulnerability internal internal vulnerability can then transform into systemic vulnerability and therefore that becomes something for you to watch out for even though and the distinction that we draw here is uh, the normal kind of systemically important Matri importance matrix looks at a lot of prudential indicators. What is the capital you're holding? What is what is your loan book like? How how much are you interconnected? So on so forth. But so definitely capital is one proxy of interconnectedness but increasingly technology or platformization is becoming another proxy of uh, interconnectedness right so let's say if a dominant payment system was to um, kind of come down and even if they were only facilitating peer to peer small ticket payments but they had become an integral part of p2p payments then that they are coming down would not be as much of a problem prudentially as it would be in the day to day functioning of the financial ecosystem so technological vulnerabilities are this uh, third bucket that we identify uh, the fourth bucket that we identify are those of frauds and these are not uh, provider initiated frauds but these are frauds that are external to the provider consumer contract. So uh, we know lots of those as impersonation, eSIM swaps. Uh, Shrikant, you yourself have like a wide uh, kind of detailed work on all of this. So frauds are another consumer protection risk. And the last risk that I would want to call out is uh, the transmission of risk itself. And this one is a little bit more interesting and I think speaks a little bit more directly to the digital interface. So with dematerialization of regulated entities and with technologies displacing uh, regulated institutions, sometimes the risk is now directly transferred to the consumer. I'll take the case of a P2P lending. So as long as loans were being intermediated by a bank, the backend lender had the security of the bank and the front end lender had the bank to fall back on if there was a consumer protection, uh, the front end borrower had the bank to fall back on if there was a cons consumer protection violation. Now, if you take the bank out of the picture and there are two strangers who are carrying out that uh, kind of um, transaction where one person is lending to the other, then the consumer protection framework that is kind of uh, guiding both of them or protecting both of them has gone very weak because there is no sin single risk holding entity now. Both of them are exposed to risk directly uh, that emanates from each other. So a lot has now been a kind of, uh, I would say, given back or redistributed to the consumer and we're kind of in the consumer beware uh, ecosystem again as long as technology continues to displace uh, regulated institutions the reason that i kind of went into this typology is that only about two of these are more pronounced in the digital lending ecosystem but broadly all of those risks can emerge 
can emerge both in the digital and the non-digital interfaces. And therefore, the whole idea of focusing of risks in just digital ecosystem, I think, might be a slippery slope to begin with. What would have been better is you look at the activity of credit, how it is being performed, and where are the risks that are generated at each point, and then come up with a more wholesome understanding of the problem and solutions and nuance them for digital interfaces if you would have to. But doubling down and the, creating the starting point as digital lending, to my mind, creates an asymmetric treatment of uh, lenders and non-lenders. So that's my first reaction to the report. Uh, my second reaction to the report is that the rep I, I quite commend the effort of the report to recognize three dimensions of problems and solutions, the regulatory dimension, the data protection dimension, as well as the consumer protection dimension. I think that's a very thorough job. Uh, the fear at the time of the making of the report was that the whole problem of unsuitability would perhaps get uh, kind of dwarfed by the whole misuse of data that was being reported in the news so frequently. So if you would recall, by the end of December 2020, these uh, incidents were more being reported like abuse of data, harassment, using of social, uh, social media data, using of personal in uh, information, for instance, pictures. But uh, the fear was that the committee would perhaps just come out with data protection type provisions and forget the larger problem of unsuitable loans. That has definitely not happened. So I think great job done there. But I do think that there is no uh, paradigmatic shift in what the committee is suggesting. Uh, the bulk of it still seems to rely on regulations, either new or existing. And we don't see how uh, some thinking has been done already to say why regulations would work this time around if they didn't work until, let's say, 2021. I just want to say that our own quick analysis told that uh, lending service providers, which is the term that the committee uh, uses to refer to all actors who are engaged in the value chain of lending, except balance sheet lenders. So if you are an entity that is using that, uh, that a balance sheet lender is using to acquire customers or for debt collection or to underwrite, you would be characterized as lending service provider. Our quick analysis told us that almost all lending service providers that were partnering with regulated entities were falling e either under the BC regulation or under the outsourcing guideline regulation. So there was to my mind, and I would be happy to be corrected by this group, but as far as we've been able to figure out, there was not a lot of uh, activity or entities that were not falling in one of the two regulations at least. And therefore to think that a lending service provider regulation plus SRO would change things drastically, I think we only, I mean, only results can tell us, but I do think that it's a little bit of an ambitious plan. And we don't see enough levers in the report to make sure that that plan actually gets uh, converted. The last kind of uh, parting point before I hand it back to you is the logic of the committee seems to be that there are these unregulated lenders that are problem creators. And there are these, uh, how do I say, contracts between regulated entities and lending service providers that are source of problem. For the unregulated lenders, the report says that let's create a Government of India Act and let's ban unregulated lending. And uh, for the others, they, there's a host of uh, recommendations that we'll perhaps touch upon in the course of this conversation. Long story short, what I'm trying to say is when I'm a consumer, I'm in desperate need of credit, I would not know how to distinguish between a regulated and an unregulated lender. Even within a regulated lenders, there are classes, for instance, some kinds of products, let's say the BNPL product be regulated by the government of India. The STCC could have another bunch of regulation. Again, from, from the point of view of a consumer, I would not know the differences between the regulations that are backing each of these products. And therefore, from the point of view of consumer, I think we need to have a wholesome universal consumer protection framework as opposed to a very product specific consumer protection framework because otherwise what we're doing is we're placing the onus back on the consumer to compare an array of products available to them and see which one provides them maximum protection. And that is not ideal. We've seen it in the past. It's, and it especially doesn't work in credit-related products where there are tons of behavioral biases that are operating on the consumer. So I would say that the report leans in the favor of, um, of an entity-based regulation regime 
when really what we needed was an activity-based regulation regime and the activity being that of credit. It didn't matter if you were a digital lender or a lender. It didn't matter if you were a BNPL lender or a P2P lender. As long as you were engaged in, you were either enabling credit or giving out credit in your balance sheet, there should have been one more thoughtful consumer protection framework that should have governed the activities and promised the consumer a little bit more. So I think those are my big reactions to the report. Yeah, thanks, Mini. I, uh, I'll probably put in another way. Uh, in, in fact, uh, every lending is actually a digital lending in today's world. Just like how uh, there is no payment system that's not digital, even a paper-based uh, check system is a digital payment system today, right? So, so in that sense, though the working group report did not suggest about going about defining digital lending, uh, it it does kind of. Uh, from seeing from a digital lens, I mean, everything is digital. So, so in that sense, uh, your point about uh, regulating credit uh, should be the primary focus with an additive, uh, let's say, focus on let's say algorithms or data use and, and stuff like that, which are unique to digital world. Uh, with that, I'll come to Prasanto. Uh, sir, you had uh, mentioned about uh, the SRO uh, that has caught your attention. Uh, as uh, somebody who's seen uh, regulations across the digital space uh, in, in multiple sectors uh, and uh, uh, and SROs of various kinds, uh, where and how do you see an SRO uh, as uh, an instrument to kind of uh, get an industry regulated? What are uh, the advantages and, and kind of pitfalls? So uh, we, that is to understand like uh, how long uh, should an SRO extend and where should the regulator kind of kick in and say that uh, these areas of uh, regulation would be under the regulator itself and these are some things that the SRO can kind of uh, better manage so that the industry kind of gets uh, or onto a common uh, scheme of things and how does this work for uh, consumer protection again things like SRO for uh, inter-industry coordination or net, uh, uh, things like that can work differently, but how, how does this work for a consumer protection uh, uh, issues? Okay, thanks, uh, Shrikant. So I'm going to just step back a little on a couple of the larger points, although I think everything has been very uh, adequately covered and especially by Benny, uh, the quite a few points that she has made. So I'm not going to repeat those. Uh, I think I'd broadly say that, you know, having worked closely with the payment sector and the regulation there, uh, you know, I'm a great fan of light touch regulation. And what we've seen is that in the payment sector, there is a disruption which has clearly happened with the, you know, the digital startups, people, uh, entities coming from outside banking and kind of disrupting an area which the banks felt that, uh, you know, they should have kind of had uh, or it should have been exclusively theirs. <clears throat> now, light touch regulation is something that has been strongly sort of recommended discussed and urged by various entities i think most strongly or maybe first by the wattle committee uh, and we can see the pushback that the regulator and in fact the banking system had against that you know including simple things like digital kyc versus no wet signature and you know face to face kyc and things like that so the light touch regulation i think i mean I've, we've seen some attempts here and i think the attempt here is uh, this two-tier kind of a system, you know, where you have the balance sheet lenders uh, who are directly regulated. So the similar example is NPCI, which is which is of course which is regulated, but uh, UPI apps, which are third-party uh, application providers, TPAPs, they're not directly regulated, but NPCI regulates them. Uh, the difference there is, of course, NPCI is, uh, I mean, it has powers which uh, kind of put it in the quasi-regulatory kind of space, and that's how it sort of communicates and it. Uh, you know, I, it, it virtually uh, controls or, you know, I mean, the effect and the power that it has is probably more than what the different BSLs, uh, whoever they uh, may be, uh, are likely to have. So uh, therefore, you probably need a more nuanced kind of an approach here. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, but I, I, I think this is the, the, the light touch part of it and to address the regulatory capacity issue, which is something that I think is of great concern. Uh, that's how they are hoping to look at it. Uh, although uh, I'm not sure if, again, I think some of the issues that uh, Benny mentioned, uh, I'll just touch upon a couple of other aspects of it, which uh, 
continue to which will continue to raise some concerns on the regulatory capacity part okay uh, i'll just mention that i think it's uh, there are lots of things i mean first of all the report is very comprehensive and i think it's very important to bring uh, you know every entity including buy now pay later etc into the system uh, not just for regulation and uh, consumer protection of the consumers or the customers of those particular apps but as well as for reporting and for the larger ecosystem because you know if there are uh, defaults if there are issues uh, typically if it's outside the system it doesn't get back into the system in terms of information and uh, neither adds to the credit score and more important than the credit score of individuals i think is the uh, aggregation of the type of issues which is something in the payment system which happens brilliantly for example in cards the kind of frauds etc globally there's uh, you know uh, there's anti aml anti money laundering and fraud systems which aggregate the kind of issues so if there's a particular kind of fraud uh, it would and it's something that is at the edge of the envelope of fraud uh, for the fraud score for that transaction this is then integrated into the system and next time the algorithm takes care of it so that you know the fraud envelope is slightly tweaked etc uh, so this is something to kind of keep uh, uh, you know sort of be aware of here uh, i think the one uh, last thing i'll make before i come to the uh, the the sro part of it is that uh, there's one uh, key area which often gets left out and which even in the payment system and possibly here it will happen and that's the importance of the whole ui and the ux as far as the consumer is concerned now i think benny mentioned the dark patterns thing and you know how using a certain this thing by checking in and you leaving something on by default like travel insurance you can get most people into something that they didn't really plan to but on the flip side of it where it's not a you know uh, a, a, the the intent is not dark as it were uh, you still have a problem because if you just take a look at again and i keep going back to payments because i think that's matured quite a bit in terms of what it's gone through uh, look at the simple thing of giving a currency note i give you a currency note there's no doubt about it so however illiterate the other the recipient might be with zero literacy he knows whether he's receiving or giving that is not true in digital payments and that is why there's a huge amount of fraud where the person thinks he's receiving money but he's actually ending up giving an otp which okay now the rules and the fine print are there which says you know the the entity is not responsible because you have shared an otp etc but you're not addressing the root cause here what is the standardization that is there which clearly tells the person that you are paying you are not receiving okay this is a problem we've had across the system however much the regulation is i mean just as an example atms are still not standardized you know you different atms have and that's why when demonetization happened you had endless queues because people were struggling for the first time just to get a 2000 rupee note out of that atm because it's not standard as even today just to get money out you will go through different hoops and at least 10 steps which are all different for different atms and i'm not even counting the language factor so this standardization of a few things here what is the equivalent here about giving and receiving money here one thing is you are taking a loan that should be very clear okay whether it's a buy now pay later or it's something else if it's a loan it should be very clear uh, there are aspects of it in the report i think they have said you know the the apr should be completely clear and it should be you should be aware that if you are paying 100% or 50% uh, apr or whatever it is it should be told to you equally it should be flagged that okay by clicking on this you are actually taking a loan okay and the associated apr is this uh, i think that would be very very significant because if there is default later because the consumer wasn't aware but you know the entire entity all the the bsl and the uh, lending service provider they are all covered because they followed the rule that doesn't really help because the consumer is you know hit and i think as benny was saying in terms of the risks uh, i mean his credit score goes for a toss okay because he's not able to pay back and you know that's really not fair because of something that the the ux or the ui wasn't good enough so i think that is uh, that's a very significant factor on the sros and you know last part so i'll just come to the question uh, sros have not really worked very well in quite a few areas and i'm sure there are areas that they have but the areas that i'm kind of familiar with uh, you know uh, the sro is often a way to get in and head off an issue uh, 
uh, and this is something that you know at tech we've just seen about uh, a week or so ago a sort of a self-regulatory entity is has been attempted to be formed and i think that's a good thing but clearly that has happened because it was headed into a place where the government is raising a lot of questions about aggressive sales tactics etc similarly in media which is a part that i come from you have a lot of self-regulatory entities in different parts okay including the press council of india and a whole bunch of others and they haven't really worked very well for a whole number of reasons okay they're toothless okay uh, you know editors guild or press council of india they can issue uh, statements condemning things which have happened even within uh, you know a media entity or something like that but uh, it it hasn't really worked very well so uh, i would say that you know if you're looking at this or you're looking at a entity which is supposed to uh, I think there's this thing called Digita, which is uh, being dis described in there, and they are saying that it should actually look at every app before it goes onto the system. I mean, way, way, way overkill. Uh, if you're going to have an inline process where apart from the platform itself validating every app before this, it actually has to go through a government associated entity. It's simply not going to work. Okay, and that is simply overkill. Uh, I would say that, I mean, the best way is to use existing rules uh, if the app platforms, for example, uh, make them uh, responsible uh, for uh, set. They already, you know, they already take a lot of responsibility or at least they're supposed to validate a whole bunch of apps and things like that. They've been responsible for, uh, you know, overcharging and uh, using their monopoly positions. And for that, I think there are we have antitrust rules uh, in place for that. So I would really look at using existing rules uh, and trying to do a balance in terms of like touch regulation so that, you know, if you say, OK, ban FLDG, first loss default guarantee, which essentially knocks off the you know third party guarantors of credit. OK, uh, that or the whole set of things, you know, a tight crackdown on decentralized finance. Uh, clearly, these are something that uh, banks would be pretty happy about. The IBA would be pretty happy about. but not the digital startup ecosystem which really needs lighter touch which needs innovation and in that process they will end up competing and probably eating up some of the pie that the banks have uh, you know which is fine so that's a kind of set of thoughts and i hope i was able to answer a bit about the sro yes so uh, i mean some of these things on the report itself has been kind of outward facing in the sense that uh, uh, what is this entity, regulated, unregulated, LSP or, or a bank, uh, doing, not doing, should do, uh, and hence kind of says that uh, this is how uh, regulation should be. I mean, that includes even the digital uh, trust uh, thing that you talked about, Digita. But I want to ask RP uh, a slightly different question. Uh, as a regulator uh, of... Uh, uh, finance uh, and the banks, RBA has also had its own failures. And, and uh, as somebody who's reported the, uh, the PC financial story, which kind of brought up uh, one of the major uh, digital lending scam, if I may call that, uh, which kind of showed like how a, a player was completely uh, practicing all kind of uh, uh, rogue practices while completely being uh, under a regulated entity which is supposed to uh, be under the supervision of RBI uh, and uh, has uh, bypassed pretty much every other regulation that has been there uh, and RBI is kind of caught off guard uh, and now we have enforcement like this proceedings against the company. Uh, so the report cites market monitoring as, as one means to kind of uh, Kind of uh, better regulate uh, the digital lending ecosystem. But, uh, what are some of the things that you think that RBI should do besides, let's say, social media monitoring uh, to improve consumer protection? Uh, Ati, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Hi. Uh, thanks, Rikant. I think you know we have discussed this enough, and and it's pretty odd to be on the other side of the table, you know, instead of asking questions and <laughs> part of the panel. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, every time I do a story and uh, I did that PC financial story and uh, to be honest, my only anger or, or 
the thing was only one question I kept on asking was, what the hell RBI was doing till date, right? Uh, I'm doing, I have done a couple of stories post that and before that. And every time I ask this question, like what RBI has been doing on this, and, I, and it's not just about uh, PC financial minded. We are not even talking about digital lending platforms, which like non-regulated ones, right? These are, for example, even Kudos Finance for that matter, the, the founder got arrested, right? On PMLA issue. I think the industry sees us very differently. I mean, uh, the arrest is quite a shocking news for the industry, what I have been talking um, uh, to them. And everybody thought that in, they could have just been penalized for not, for all, all such you know activities but an arrest is something also kind of expose the how the regulators or how the authorities work you know that's a different story altogether but uh, to be honest i mean you know here we talk about the likes of you know paytm bharat pay cred you know uh, building a book of 1000 crore and you know and raising at some crazy uh, valuation right and here in just one year, PC Financial kind of uh, made a book of uh, 10,000 crore. Uh, and, you know, it kind of, and there was this ex-RBI official also on that board as, uh, you know. Thing is, um, I really want to know the auditing uh, process of RBI. And everybody do, you know, uh, does admit that, you know, RBI, uh, there are certain threshold of like NDFCs and all cannot be audited so rigorously and, uh, you know, strictly, but there has to be, right? I mean, otherwise, there has to be a certain setup, like fintech department, we are yet to see how that department is going to work or function later on. But there has to be, I mean, either was don't, I mean, they, they are the ones who kind of literally controlled these you know, some of these NBFCs, they literally controlled the last two, three years. And that's when these scams we started seeing, right? Otherwise, before also, there were a couple of digital lending platforms. We didn't see, uh, you know, such uh, bad practices, like over leveraging of customers. And, uh, okay, I, I'll, I'll also start with, you know, one very interesting, like four years ago, like when I was in Bangalore talking to one of the major fintech today, digital lending platform, and the founder you know, admitted that, you know, we, we track customer, like even if he is, you know, let's say in some village and, you know, there is something in the app that we can trace that person down and we will know where that person is right now, you know, just through the app. Uh, and I was just discussing this with my editor and we were like, you know, if they have money, they'll have to also return. So see, that's the basic thing. We also understand if somebody has borrowed money, he has to return that money. And this is, this is like harsh truth, which, you know, what the companies are doing, uh, you know, we are also neglecting the fact I'm also part of some of the consumers group. To be honest, there are so many apps that even I would not know that exist. But in that consumer group, you will know that there are so many apps that I won't even know, you know, even by going on the Google Play Store and just doing a research. So there are smart consumers as well who are kind of, you know, uh, kind of taking advantage of these loopholes that, you know, they know that all this scam activity has been happening and regulators are taking a tough stance. I'm sorry, Shrikant, but I'm taking a like a different, you know, view altogether from co company to consumers. So all I'm saying is uh, consumers also need to look at because they, I, I look at the chats, you know, the, doing uh, while doing one of my stories i have been part of some other consumer groups they have put in me to like to kind of you know notice uh, that how uh, uh, they have been harassed by uh, digital lenders but at the same time their conversations are really interesting ones like you know they keep looking for such apps where they can get money and they keep looking for some foreign apps for that matter i don't know how do they identify that and they make sure that you know take the loan and don't pay and uh, you know then we'll make a uh, heck about that app maybe on social media so i've also spoken to some of the industry players and there has been some activities where some customers are misusing right the uh, so many apps coming in the market having said that uh, you know after doing that pc financial story and some of the other like you know uh, tracking some of the other uh, digital lenders i've come across like you know 
I think only this got exposed only last two years, ever since this lockdown happened. Before that, I'm assuming this could be a trend, but in a more subtle and sophisticated way. And then maybe, uh, you know, it was not exposed as it is now. Uh, I don't know who played a better, uh, like, you know, the uh, worst role. I mean, whether it was the companies, because I know there were a couple of, you know, NDFCs I was talking to then at one point, you know, there were so many NDFCs and they were just including P2P, by the way. They were just taking it as a business, like a great business opportunity because these Chinese lenders or these, you know, foreign apps would come to India and then they would look for all such NDFCs, you know, and they were giving some crazy uh, uh, ROIs. I mean, of course, FLDG was one part. And then, of course, on top of that, they were giving some kind of crazy returns or, you know, percentage to that NDFC, the license holder. So it was a, so whichever company was like, you know, just having no business case then, or maybe we're just struggling to kind of uh, with a very lower, uh, you know, revenue, they lapped it up like an, you know, a big opportunity, like, you know, why not to, uh, you know, just partner with them and earn something. So that was their case. But having said that, uh, you know, even I, I was just talking to somebody just day before yesterday. Uh, this has not come down, you know, uh, like earlier, it was, of course, the NBFCs. And I've also written, I've also highlighted earlier in my stories that, you know, there were some apps who were kind of not really uh, even going through NBFC channels and they were having direct integration with the payment gateway and then they will start collecting and, you know, disbursing money. So, are payment gateways uh, under so much scanner of like RBI? I mean, even they are the regulated entities or maybe they are regulated now. So I think they should also be brought under, you know, a lot of scrutiny because uh, NBFC partnership is one, but payment gateway, I think we have been hearing, you know, so many payment gateway stories we heard that, you know, they blocked some 450 apps, 350 apps, uh, but they were only there to kind of block apps. They only ED and cybercrime officials used to give them like, you know, you have to block apps and they used to do by saying that, okay, hamara kaam ho gaya. now, you know, we are done, uh, whatever we are being said, we are doing, but, but uh, you can't ignore the fact that you were the ones who kind of did you really do that KYC? What are those companies for? What are they doing? You know? So, I'm taking from consumer part, you know, it's it's their duty also. I'm also taking like, you know, the banks. If you'll be amazed with the fact, the kind of stories that, you know, company employees and officials have to say, how companies are kind of misusing this entire thing and they ju just can't miss on revenues, right? They just can't. Nobody wants to miss on making some money out of this whole thing, uh, you know, ignoring the fact that how it is kind of, uh, uh, you know, killing or uh, how is it kind of, you know, impacting the market and the consumers, right? Over leveraging are some of the things I think, you know, uh, even the report also talks about and FLDG, I really want to come on that. Uh, as Prasanto very well said that, you know, FLDG is one part, all fintechs in India, I think they are just working on FLDG model. And uh, as Ravi was pointing it out, like, you know, the entire industry through industry bodies, they were just writing to RBI on, you know, to make FLDG, uh, if, if it is kind of, you know, FLDG becomes um, uh, what, you know, um, what do we call that word, you know, uh, so the whole entire, uh, the entire industry is going to shut down because, you know, nobody is going to ta take that risk, you know, so, uh, and, and there is, of course, a push from the banks also, even the banks, uh, after talking to a few bankers, banks also admit the fact that, you know, uh, yes, it is a push from the banks because the moment, you know, imagine, I mean, PC Financial, just one example, and it's a very good example in a way that in one year, they silently built such a big book, nobody, and here, nobody even thought about it, you know, and they were, they were a big NDFC, but still they were doing everything so silently, 
so there may be couple of ndfcs couple of digital lending um, you know platforms who might be doing such crazy stuff and building such high books and this somewhere you know even banks are not liking it you know their market is really getting disrupted by these uh, digital lenders so there has to be a balance you know uh, between what companies are doing because i am not too techy so i won't be able to kind of really talk about you know the the architecture the consent architecture you know i think that will be much more clear when this data protection law, uh, law comes in you know till then everything is just a talk you know how it should be what data should be uh, kept and what data should not be kept uh, before that law i don't think uh, the discussion on that makes too much of sense but there has to be a balance between you know what consumers are doing today uh, there are many many millions of relevant cases where consumers are really facing the heat of you know the bad collection practices by these lenders but at the same time some consumers are really misusing uh, the system and on the second uh, like on the other side i mean uh, the the industry has to think through like you know fldg or no fldg they really need to kind of i think everything is a question or everything is a like result of over leveraging you know till till now whatever stories i have done i have realized that you know over leveraging is something really we we kind of really uh, you know ignore that one point because a customer has taken 10 different loans from 10 different apps at the same time and we all know because you know there uh, there is no real time monitoring or real time you know credit bureau reporting happening so we all know that they are not going to pay it on time so there has to be i don't know that uh, that structure is yet to go live in a, a massive way uh, that cic right i mean the real time monitoring of a uh, credit reporting that was supposed to come uh, i don't know how that is going to help but uh, we can only assume that you know the fintech department including that uh, real time credit bureau reporting uh, you know and fldg again i'm i'm not too sure on fldg i'm like if somebody wants to give loan from their equity i mean i don't know if that is much of a problem uh, you know uh, for anybody except for banks who really think that their market is disrupted and uh, yeah i mean cu- customers are any which is getting money they want right they m- banks are not giving them uh, the money at the time uh, when they need it the most so there has to be balance rbi really needs to look into it and above all you know there are so many loopholes and there are so many like you know unethical ways of the fldg is one thing right but in my recent story i also kind of mentioned how a company was kind of just because they want to do aggressive lending you know in the account where nbfc needs to even put that fldg money you know the fintech is kind of putting in, in its own money so that you know disbursement happens and it doesn't stop so again that is a clear violation of law point is of course fintech platforms they cannot they are not regulated and they cannot be kind of you know tracked and audited by the rbi but rbi needs to set up because fintech is no longer a small industry it has become huge and uh, there are too many players uh, right and they have become really really big now so rbi need to really come up with some proper auditing mechanism i mean no matter how small the nbfc is uh, you know they needs to be audited i mean at a regular regular interval i think that is what i feel uh, you know and this is very lame and because you know it, it all is on the basis of when i do a story you know after talking to consumers after talking to industry players so i may not be into that deep tech and you know consent uh, architecture uh, part no i'll, I'll uh, two important points raised there like one is about consumers over leveraging and consumer behavior itself which mm. uh, i don't know we should probably talk as a consumer organization as well but uh, I'll, i'll skip that part and move to the other interesting thing that you mentioned i'll combine with what prasanto mentioned in terms of ux uh, is, is, there was a recent circular in upi which said that uh, e mandate bounce which was meant to serve a credit if it uh, bounces it is considered equivalent under negotiable instrument act uh, and my only grudge was that uh when a person is setting up uh, an e mandate for whatever uh, how th- 
does he or she know whether that this bounce, if this bounces, uh, it's actually equivalent to a check bounce? Because that's uh, that was done through an NPCA circular. So it's, in industry and it's in paper, it's all good. But how does the consumer know whether uh, if this mandate bounces and the consumer may have like 10 mandates? Now, of the 10 mandates, how does the consumer know whether this mandate is uh, for a credit? And, and we don't even know with, with all this BNPL and AC stuff, we don't know what is credit, what is not. So that, there again, I bring in Prasanto's point about uh, a very simple uh, standardization that's missing, and, and which is like in, in, in more than one way, key to consumer protection. Because other, if a consumer does not know, uh, then it's, it's actually bad penalizing them, right? Uh, uh, and with that, I'll come back to Benny uh, and, and I'll highlight uh, Dwara's response uh, which sought an independent financial consumer protection uh, enforcement body uh, for achieving the goal stated uh, of consumer protection. And uh, what are your thoughts broadly on an organization design of such an entity? And, and why can't uh, this be done by the Department of Enforcement in RBI or now the new FinTech Department? Because we keep having more departments and uh, agencies uh, and the problem seems to continue to exist. Uh, I just want to also, before I uh, completely go into that question, I want to quickly reflect on what Aarti said. I think Aarti made one more very important point, which was to say that no matter how big or small, it doesn't really matter. The size of the entity doesn't really matter because their potential for consumer harm doesn't seem to be so tightly correlated to their size. So I just want to distinguish two things here that, uh, uh, and this is uh, Regulation 101, and I'm clearly uh, not the expert here, but just to kind of quickly recall that uh, financial regulation has two, uh, two kind of uh, objectives, right? One is systemic stability to make sure that the system keeps going so that your balance sheets are strong, uh, you're not over leveraging, all of those kinds of things. And the second is consumer protection which is to say that uh, consumers uh, are not treated unfairly, the products that they get are safe, uh, grievance redress is strong, uh, so on and so forth. It's ethical uh, and, and everything else that we know. Now, uh, what happens is uh, for two, I, I think what is becoming clearer, uh, especially if we follow the conversations of the BIS for, from the last year and a half, but also Indian regulators and also regulators abroad that Prudential concerns, uh, for instance, you know, the amount of capital you need to have, the reserves that you need to have, the kind of loan loss provisioning you need to do, all of those, they seem to have some relationship with the size of the entity, right? And even if I want to do a heavy touch versus a light touch regulation, it depends on assets under management, it depends on your size of the loan book, the whole NBFC criteria that we're seeing, if you're at a distance from the regulator, that's because you're too small of a player. And that makes sense from a systemic stability point of view, because in the overall system, they're too small, they're collapsing, would not have ripple effects, it would not bring down the system, so on and so forth. And therefore, basing size uh, as a criteria for prudential regulation makes sense. Here, what we saw was when all regulation, including consumer protection regulation, was tethered to the idea of size, which was to say that smaller units could fly under your radar, did not have as much close inspection, and then those smaller units unfortunately turned out to be the ones that took kind of advantage of this regulatory vacuum and kind of indulged in mal malpractices that they did. So what we are now thinking and what uh, the rationale for our kind of recommendation of an independent body came from the fact that RBI's core mandate seems to be prudential regulation systemic stability. And for, their, for that kind of a thing, risk proportionate regulation, regulation based on size, on the size of your loan sheets, assets under management, so on and so forth, makes complete sense. However, consumer protection risks don't really depend on the size of the entity. And therefore, consumer protection regulation needs to be uniform. And it... Uh, Everybody needs to be held to the same standard when it comes to consumer protection because the nature of the entity does not really matter when consumer risks are concerned. For instance, if there is a credit product being offered, then the harms of you know, information asymmetry, improper disclosures, they remain the same across the kind of entities that are providing the loans, the types of loans. It doesn't matter if it's a mortgage loan, if it's gold, if it's anything else, if it's a JLG, if it's an education, BNPL, it's 
all of that doesn't really matter because consumer protection concerns we found are agnostic both to the kind of product that you're talking and the kind of entity that is offering them. And therefore, we say that a consumer protection mandate is better rests with a separate agency which is dedicated only to supervising and enforcing consumer protection. And I think that's, that's the first kind of principle argument. The second principle argument that we make is Enforcement alone is not enough. Uh, I may be a little bit out of my place, but I'm going to venture out to say that uh, if enforcement were enough, then perhaps we would not have seen that episode that we did see, and perhaps all of these incidents would not have existed. The fact is that for enforcement to work well, it needs to be guided by supervision. So supervision is ex ante identification of premature violations before they blow up into systematic or large scale violations, right? So that's what supervision does. It is ex ante on the lookout for uh, potential violations. And what enforcement does is once a violation has surfaced, how do you penalize it? How do you make good to the people who have lost their money? How do you make sure that it's deterrence enough for other players and for the player themselves involved? So enforcement is ex post after a violation has happened, but supervision is ex ante before a violation even happens. Can we make sure that people are abiding and confirming to the laws in a way that the probability of occurrence of violations minimizes itself. Now, we think that both supervision and enforcement for consumer protection need not guided by the same criteria that guide prudential regulation. That's one. Second is that supervision and enforcement both by themselves are chunky activities. So the report itself uh, looks at market monitoring. It looks at sharing of information across, I don't know how many intelligence units, uh, telecom uh, units. There's a bunch of things there, right? And you need information to be shared from such a portal, from grievance redress, from ombudsman, et cetera, et cetera. And why do we need all of that? We need all of that so that, so that a clear picture of the market begins to emerge and the regulator can focus on emerging problems before they become systemic concerns. Now, all of that would require a lot of capacity which we don't think exists with the RBI. Again, I think it would be a bit more premature for me to comment on the ability of the fintech department to do this because we have yet to see what the plans and the structure for that fintech department is. But as of now, the enforcement, to your question, why can't the enforcement department do it? The enforcement department could well do it if A, it were not deploying the same criteria as prudential regulation because consumer protection requires a different logic. And B, if it were supported by a supervisory ex ante arm that was doing the market monitoring, that was already surfacing problems for it, and telling its enforcement arm, hey, here is the market intelligence. These are the kinds of cases that are emerging. These are the kinds of cases that you need to go about. The third thing that I'm going to say, and I have to admit here that I haven't very closely followed the activities of the enforcement department in the past, but to my mind, following responsive regulation is very important. What we have heard of enforcement department in the past is some, um, I want to say, few and far in between. Again, my caveat that I've not been following it very closely, but some big penalties do make the headlines. So for instance, you'll have the national paper carrying the enforcement department slaps this much CR on this entity for doing that. But we don't get a systematic understanding of what the enforcement department is doing. When we don't get that, there are two fears. One is industry participants themselves, it's not deterrence enough. When a, slap, when a penalty is slapped, people are left thinking whether it was the actual reason if there was something else that was brewing behind, uh, if there were a couple of uh, violations that had been bunched together and that's how this amount was arrived at, there is no transparency and that reduces the deterrence effect because they think that no, there must have been something more to this and we are definitely not doing that. So there's one. Second is there is no check on the powers of the enforcement department itself, which is also very worrying from the industry point of view. As long as you're not transparent, as long as you're not giving logic about what you're doing and why you're doing, then um, though it, it creates, it adds to business uncertainty as opposed to adding to consumer confidence. So I think enforcement department could well do it if it were aided by supervisory arm, if it were aided by the logic of consumer protection, and if it were aided by responsive regulation. So our idea is not to say that, oh no, we need a separate agency. Our idea is to say that we need an agency who's able to perform both ex ante, ex post functions and share market intelligence 
with relevant actors in time before they become systematic issues. To the last point, why did we come up with the idea of a separate agency? Well, it, it seems to be kind of a more, um, how do I say? It seems to me at least a more uh, clear demarcation of functions because we know then that one arm is only engaging with the prudential logic and the second arm is only engaging with the consumer protection logic. We've seen it work in other, organ in other jurisdictions, for instance, the US where the CFPB is quite active. It also makes sure that bandwidth is not, so basically each agency then gets their own bandwidth. And the way we would imagine such an agency to function is that it would have its own budget. It would be in charge of designing its own uh, kind of functions. It would have its own levels of expertise. It would be more digital savvy. It would be able to run APIs. It would be able to run, collect a lot of market information in real time, so on and so forth. Things that we are typically not seeing at least at the public facing level of the RBI. It might have been happening inside. We do not know that. But for all of these reasons, we thought that it was apt to have a separate consumer protection agency. And uh, just a quick follow up. Uh, this has been on the talk since the FSLRC, right? The Financial Redress Agency. But why do you think that there's been uh, no activity on that front for almost a decade now, if I say so? And I have to admit that uh, you've been watching it more closely than I have. I've just entered like a few years back. But if I had to guess, then uh, she can't. It's. It, what my own reading has been that wherever there is an intersectoral regulatory coordination. So, you know, for instance, the RBI did create an integrated ombudsman, long time waiting, but finally it's here. And there is much to be said about that because uh, we know how much we needed an integrated ombudsman. It was hard for a consumer to identify where they must post their complaints, if they posted their complaints to a different ombudsman, they used to get rejected. So in terms of consumer protection, an integrated ombudsman for the RBI level is a great thing. What would have been even better is an integrated grievance redress across sectors, especially for digital finance, where embedded finance is common, where merging of two products is common, so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, for instance, if BNPL is not purely a credit product, where do you go and complain about it right now today? It's unclear. But if there were an integrated ombudsman or grievance redress across sectoral regulators, there could have been at least one kind of, uh, you know, port of call for consumers to go to. Why it has had why it hasn't happened so far, I suppose, is wherever it requires coming together of a couple of regulators, I think things get harder to do. Uh, and maybe because there is no precedent of, of that, uh, no precedence of that in the country, or we haven't yet worked out those pathways where regulators can come and interact at a level, uh, you know that is basically amenable to all regulators. But this is something for the Shared Development Council, we saw this, for the Shared CKYC, we saw this. But wherever I suppose it takes coming together of regulators, things do get delayed, is my understanding. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. It's more like uh, giving up power. So in that sense, there is enough resistance by multiple regulators there. So I'll, I'll come back uh, to a question on Digita uh, to both uh, Prasanto and Ravi. Uh, so Prasanto, do you see that uh, this Digita is some kind of an early stage for regulating the app economy itself for consumer protection? Because not just in fintech, I mean, with the loan apps, it has kind of got blown up uh, with an entire consumer protection failure, but we've also been seeing issues around uh, uh, apps uh, and there has been talk of app store regulation, both from the industry itself, uh, in terms of the app store commissions and stuff. Uh, there's also a state sovereignty issue. We've seen that with the Apple versus Try. Uh, do you see uh, this digital as some kind of a way to kind of regulate uh, the app economy and, and uh, and the RBI report itself doesn't say uh, whether it be a common body, it just says uh, uh, some agency uh, and not nothing beyond that. So what are your thoughts on Digita? And and to Ravi, uh, you've been victim of yourself uh, with another digital lender posing uh, themselves with the same name of your app. Uh, and it took Google a month and a half to kind of get that app removed. Uh, and how do you see Digita kind of fixing that problem and, and uh, problem of, uh, let's say, uh, brand misuse and, and stuff? Uh, like Because this, again, impacts as a consumer, because if I'm 
going to store and wanting to download your app and then download some other app it's, it's an issue right so so how do you see this digital uh, playing about uh, yeah prasanto yeah so uh, so good question there and i think uh, first of all yes uh, that seems to be the intent uh, that you know from here you move on to other uh, fintech apps and maybe other parts of the app ecosystem and to that i really think that uh, first of all i'd already said earlier that an inline sort of validation system is something that they don't have the capacity for and even if this digita is supposed to set up that capacity uh, i mean it really doesn't make sense to do it inline in other words take it through that validate every, i mean you'll have a huge backlog of apps and what do you do about versions what is how is version control going to happen that's a nightmare i th- uh, so i mean today i think you have enough possible regulation uh, including what the platforms are doing through antitrust uh, let them be responsible as intermediaries uh, and so on however as a parallel review system and i think here i i can go to uh, i think benny made a very good point about the uh, the lack of the ex ante uh, kind of approach to uh, the regulation and market monitoring uh, because the rbi a lot of it has been fairly uh, uh, exposed action uh, which is either fines or bans uh, some of the bans are pretty extreme and whether it's hdfc or a whole bunch of card companies and so on i think that hurts hurts the market it hurts the consumers it hurts the customers of those and it reduces choice for the customer ultimately if you take a particular entity out of the market for 6 months 7 months 8 months etc so that is where uh, market monitoring uh, you know and market intelligence has a strong role to play and that is where possibly an entity like that could play a role but if it's really going to be something which is you know i mean sort of a license raj 2.0 uh, for the app economy that every app has to go through it ultimately and it sets a, a precedent i mean if you look at it the, the whole uh, data localization in the digital payment space set a precedent for what the data protection bill is now seeking to do essentially taking data localization everywhere so uh, i do see that whatever works here and it seems to work well if it does will be probably extended and i hope they don't do it in terms of this level of overkill and i hope they use it as a parallel thing and raise red flags when it happens okay because i otherwise i totally see that okay if there are problems which are detected with apps etc the answer would be ban that particular balance sheet lender uh you know which which is going to be counterproductive and i don't think that's going to so uh, i i i think there's a role for digita but that role is more parallel tracking etc and not part of the inline regulatory process if that helps yeah so, uh, yeah uh, our take on digita so uh, from what i understand uh, one bit is consumer awareness if consumers are not aware which app they are downloading which one is a genuine one you would have seen like fake payment websites come up with a certificate showing pci dss and all kind of things and people making that transaction uh, now there are two aspects to it one when an app is being downloaded let's say talk about the google ecosystem google is trying to do its bit and say that okay we have play protect we have this certification and all and they are trying to show the ratings as well to the consumer if something like a data comes up uh, then it would have to integrate there and showcase that hey this is rbi certified and this is where probably if it has to go in then uh, rbi will have to uh, liaison with the uh, google and say that okay we are certifying these apps if if they are regulating this otherwise uh, i don't think it makes sense to just publish a list and say that okay these are the top players which rbi kind of recommends or have been certified it will become more like a startup india certificate thing Uh, you would see all startups coming up getting the startup india certificate uh, but that doesn't kind of validate anything about the startup right uh, people will continue to showcase and you don't want to add regulatory burden so ultimately what happens is uh, everyone either get the certificate or it is like that text uh, exemption certificate which no one gets so uh, the compliance if if uh, data has to come up then the compliance burden should not be there and it should be more of detect and uh, then request further compliance information which prashant pointed out which is your monitoring should be so advanced that you are able to detect these lapses that okay oh this app is not genuine and you have to work with the industry partners which is probably google and uh, apple whoever they are other aspect yeah 
No, I'll, uh, I'll quickly add, uh, the RBI does publish a list of 10,000 NBFCs in an Excel file. And this is what they actually linked in the first circular for the digital lenders, for yeah. consumers to be aware. Uh, so, so yeah, I, the point taken on that they have to be fully integrated and usable for the consumer. Yes, because otherwise uh, people are not going to visit RBI site. I think the number of times you alone visit RBI site would be more than, uh, I don't know how many thousand customers should I uh, allocate it to right so uh, that is the case and uh, then digital i think uh, probably it has to come from a regulation side or maybe more of a certification okay they are certified but again we have we are doing a very poor job on consumer awareness and this is where if you look at the variety of issues that we have talked about today all four of us on probably four different uh, types of things to cover and this shows the complexity this topic has right uh, there are the ex- uh, uh, existing issues of any loan product, right? Right from your microfinance issues to this, then data related item, then systematic overall government level. Then there are uh, Chinese, foreign, whatever intervention that we came in. Uh, and then specific to our lending segment, we look at FLDG, whether no go, yes, no, we all know that it was, it is the whole fintech industry is based on FLDG. I had been so closely opposed to, uh, sorry, I had been initially very opposed to FLDG because I was like, hey, we are a technology player. Why do we want to get into the risk part? And there were no NBFCs I could find which were like, hey, I will lend because that was the problem. They were like, we don't want to lend if we are not confident. How should we rely on your model? And this is where FLDG came in. And then I think I was in a meeting where there was some deputy governor of RBI. And I said, like, what would be the take on this? People are raising concerns that FLDG shouldn't be there. And it was like, if the whole industry is moving in that direction, what do you do? Like, personally, me being opposed to that, it was like, no, probably we'll have to follow. And then we also followed FLDG uh, while doing our loan experiments. Uh, And then there are these gray areas where RBI was not clear. So people were like, oh, FLDG, we don't know. There's no regulation that bans it. There's no regulation that supports it. And there have been tons of gray areas in FinTech specifically, uh, right from, again, Aadhaar to everything that you can use this or not. Why we are asking for an NBFC to do KYC, they're like, okay, a photo also works of a PAN card. Someone is like, no, we need a, a full on loan agreement, all ki- all sorts of things. So maybe uh, one front is RBI coming up and saying that, hey, this is banned, whatever are the gray areas, they'll get that feedback from the industry, clear that out as soon as in a transparent manner. And that is done. The second part is consumer awareness. Focus on that aspect and spend a lot of money like you are spending on mutual funds. Say here, right? Uh, probably they have to do a better job there. And then comes the part around innovation and encouraging young startups. So if at the forefront of starting up, someone sees these many regulations, the VCs won't come in, the startups won't come in. You would not have all the innovation that is happening, all the experimentation. But again, as Benny was saying, that you don't want it at a consumer's cost because even if one consumer is suffering because a fintech was just fresh. But that is, I think, a, again, a very hard trade-off uh, because you cannot monitor, if, if the industry is growing this big, you cannot monitor all the one lakh entrepreneurs who are going to come. So probably you have to put a bar and say that, no, this app is impacting 10,000 customers or has become a 10 crore or 100 crore book. Now we should have a stricter regulation. So that gives the startup or the fintech ecosystem a time to adapt and say that, oh, if we graduate above this, then obviously we are going to get into uh, stricter territories and we have to have systems. So people can start and then gradually have time to adapt to all of this. And then the case around digital fraud. There again, it's it just like people today can trace a lost mobile uh, as in if the agencies wanted it, but they don't do it, right? So it's a lack of enforcement or implementation. Same way for frauds, if everything can be traced, why isn't uh, the uh, RBI or the relevant bodies coming up and saying that, hey, there is a compensation mechanism because today a person is not setting up an internet banking or a UPI because they're like, hey, there are frauds that are happening. So that just erodes the whole trust in the ecosystem. While obviously 90% players are fine, 10% is where the risk is. Another important aspect I have seen uh, uh, working wrongly in this aspect is advertising. If anyone has advertising budget, Google, Facebook are not liable for anything. They'll just say, hey, someone misused our system and that's it. But they have already made their money by providing them whatever number of visibility eyeballs. People have been scammed. And Google, Facebook are like, okay, 
we have just removed them, blocked them. There's no liability of an advertiser. Like same thing happens with newspapers as well, right? You hide a, a, a advertisement as a story and people think like, oh, there's a sale going on or something. It's actually an advertisement and, and there's no liability that is there. Hey, we probably did a wrong uh, advertising deal. So there are these tons of issues that need to be sorted. What happens in the broader fintech debate and that was happening on G business as well when the Hafta Vasuli was, People thought like, okay, every fintech app is just taking away your data and hacking. It's not hacking. Everyone, we need to obviously do a better job and explaining that, okay, access was there. Some access is being requested. We understand we needed that data. We were create, like, whichever app is uh, using SMS, they're probably trying to get a virtual bank statement because the person cannot provide a physical bank statement. With account aggregator, that thing will change. But again, there's a trade-off. There's too much of data exposure that is going to happen. How will that be leveraged? So these are matters that probably require very widespread consultation and again with widespread dimensions. Uh, so probably one thing is we should have more of it with the industry, with RBI, and it should be flexible enough, but should accommodate all. Uh, that's all I think I would say. Yes. I, I see Benny's hand up. I have one last question for Aarti and we are already slightly over time. So I'll uh, request to keep the responses short. So uh, Aarti, the question that I had for you was, uh, you did a fair bit of uh, research on the Chinese fintechs. Uh, and uh, and what is, we, we kind of all know that what has happened in China with social credit and, and so on, and we keep reading stories. Uh, and China, China being kind of at the forefront of these uh, uh, digital credit uh, in, in more ways. Uh, what do you think uh, are some of the practices? Like, if if I have to take a parallel, like uh, uh, there 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 could be bans on let's say uh, routers from China because that's a national security threat and, and so on and so forth because Chinese routers are susceptible to government surveillance and stuff. Now, if if we were to ban certain practices, uh, which are kind of originating from the Chinese fintech. What are those things uh, that need to be banned as uh, some of these uh, to kind of have uh, increased consumer protection? You are in your Sorry. Uh, to be honest, even I would not be able to uh, kind of identify whether the app is Chinese or not. Uh, only, you know, after looking at their ROC data, <laughs> I kind of, you know, uh, like uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, okay, but, you know, uh, see, some of the practices I think, I think have been kind of, you know, widely written about, uh, you know, that there are two, three routes there are certain Chinese companies uh, and it's not just two year phenomena. It, they have been coming to India, even through Singapore route, you know, through uh, Mauritius route. So I, for a fact, you know, spoke to a couple of uh, their India leaders, you know, who once they were kind of entering India, they were very much like, you know, uh, so there is certain Chinese sentiment, uh, you know, against uh, uh, you know, in India, and we kind of make sure that we are kind of setting up an entity in Singapore, and then we are getting our money even through FDI and all through that route and all. Okay, so one thing is like you know, if just a like little bit of research, I would say, you know, when I was doing for some of my stories, you know, just a little bit of research and you don't need to even pay for ROC, uh, to be honest, just on maybe some of uh, the Zoba Corp uh, uh, kind of details, if you find, you know, the directors of those companies, you know, just one company will lead to another company to, that will lead to another company. And there is a chain of companies and the directors you'll find they are on like, you know, of part of, let's say, 15, 20 companies and with the same director. So the, the modus operandi is like, you know, they just, I don't think that they just operate one app. And uh, uh, what I am uh, like hearing right now is uh, they are still not gone yet. I mean, we thought that, you know, uh, they have come down for sure uh, over last one year, ever since this crackdown happened. But what I'm hearing right now is, you know, they are just not even going to payment gateway also because there's a lot of, scrutiny from ED and all. So what they are doing is they are just directly uh, kind of setting up a bank account and, you know, they are just giving out, you know, UPI uh, links 
to the consumers and they they don't need need any like payment gateway uh, provider in between also that's what they are doing right now i'm yet to kind of look into it because you know some industry uh, players and some payment gateway providers they kind of highlighted this that this is what is happening right now so it is much more uh, you know uh, kind of you know uh, it's much more difficult now to kind of trace or track because you know it it's very difficult to kind of get those information from banks uh, you know by the ed officials or uh, uh, yeah from the authorities i would say because rbi we don't know what they are doing all all the crackdowns that we are seeing are done by only the ed and the cyber crime officials uh, so of course one is uh, they they don't operate just one app there are like multiple apps multiple setups that uh, they run and uh, on the data part i think shrikant you only kind of you know showed me uh, uh, like last year how how to kind of you know uh, see that you know all are connected to each other uh, surprisingly my only um, i i would only like to say is you know i have i have this question only to rbi i so wish to kind of you know i have been sending them questions for my stories and otherwise to kind of you know really understand what are the thought process on this overall ongoing you know because it's it's so visible through our naked eyes that we can see that you know what's wrong and how they are connected how some politicians are involved in you know how there are chain of companies with the same office address right we can see that and still uh, there is no action taken uh, so some of these things are we really need to look into i guess and uh, how they want to look into it is uh, you know something so digitize one agency then there is you know some other agency they want sros they want you know some other fintech department they want another agency i don't know what will so many agencies do i mean they really need to very set a clear uh, like you know agenda that you know the fintech department everything comes under fintech department and they are going to look into everything you know associated to fintech and uh, ndfcs uh, so there are digital ndfcs right i i don't know like we can really blame fintech uh, platforms here or we can really blame ndfcs because we we have more concerns because we even if we look into it uh, shrikant to be fair we also kind of ignore that what fintech lenders are doing right we also kind of blame the ndfcs associated because you know our mind is in a way uh, structured in a way that we also kind of put the blame on the uh, regulated entities right so with fintech department ndfcs are going to be uh, you know who work with digital lending platforms are they going to be regulated by fintech department or ndfcs i mean these things uh with so many agencies i mean come on you can bring as many agencies as you want to but uh, how do you want to really trace and track uh, the functioning of a fintech uh, and everything associated with the fintech including the nbfcs uh, they really need to be clear about i mean uh, there is a rabbit i mean name there are so many agencies we keep on forgetting but how do they want to do it and what exactly they find i mean as ravi was saying they really need to be they need to come out and open say this is wrong and this is wrong, right you know fldg is wrong completely wrong and not even in gray areas we have been discussing about so many policy documents that rbi come up with they just come up with two three liners and with you know putting everything on uh, you know uh, the companies to decide what how they want to dissect that one two liner of policy right and they just do it or they interpret that in their own way and kind of you know start operating so they have to be very very clear you know what they want and how they want the industry to operate they really need to do kind of you know just coming up with a, a policy paper and giving the industry to respond in another 15 days uh, i don't know if that is also a right way to kind of come up with a the regulation they uh, uh, because i just just i really want to point this out so a very interesting discussion i was having so the this kudos thing happened so there was a, the policy document came uh, rbi working paper in november uh, no in december right 15th 14th december i think it came uh, somewhere uh, around that time 18 december there was this arrest 
the industry was in shock they were thinking like you know we were writing to the rbi thinking ki fldg should happen or not happen please allow fldg to the industry and this happened so i don't know what they have written to the rbi so there is also a question on how ed is functioning there is also a question on how rbi is functioning there is also a question on you know what the policy paper means so uh, too much of confusion and you know uh, i'm as confused i can't have any concrete answers to i know that you asked about how to identify chinese loan apps i did tell you about you know some of the uh, the tracing mechanism but other than that i think rbi and ed if, if they can really figure out that in a, what kind of pmla uh, some of these nbfcs and fintechs have done i'm sure that they have much more nuanced you know uh, mechanism right and technologies to kind of really figure out who is flouting what kind of norms so put that in place from very start don't really let them become big you know and so that after a point we'll see and say you know this has kind of uh, blown out you know and it has really impacted so many lives i don't know whether we should or the rbi should really wait for that thing to happen they really need to i think that that you know discussion or that debate that uh, you know let that startup become or come at a certain level and then kind of monitor that i have a view if so many things are happening and if a human you know cost is involved there then it has to be from the very start and I, and i'll yeah. i'll take uh, in fact we kind of completely missed that point that you mentioned about repet and we are not even talking about cyber security this whole discussion uh, right so and bini had her hand up i'll, I'll uh, get her views I'll try to keep it to thirty seconds. I think I completely echo Arti when she says that uh, we can't apply um, thresholds to consumer protection. Consumer protection must kick in from the day you are starting, and we can't wait for you to have a certain number of consumers or a certain number of loan book uh, before you abide by sort of consumer protection regulations. That might work well on the prudential side, but uh, where, wherever there is a huge cost involved. And second, the point that RT is making that there are just too many agencies. Uh, if there's a fintech NBFC, which department is looking after them? And I do think that uh, this is where entity based regulation ends right and this is where you need to kind of harmonize the regulatory uh, posture by defining the activity and saying that no matter your size no matter the function you're performing in the value chain if you are in the credit value chain then while uh, interfacing with the consumer you must have xyz you cannot uh, miss sell you cannot misrepresent you need to have clear disclosure some of which the report does uh, but to in uh, to kind of unambiguously say that regardless of your activity status regardless of your entity status regardless of your regulatory status of your size if you are involved in these activities this applies to you period i think that would be kind of at least on the consumer protection side i'm not talking of the prudential side but on the consumer protection side i think that's one way to go and just kind of very last thoughts on fldg uh, our conversations and our analysis shows that fldg serve the function of a proof of concept for the nbfc so they wouldn't really uh, put faith in the startup if the fldg was not provided equally we think that fldg is also uh, kind of is a skin in the game for the startup right so it kind of checks moral hazard but the other problem is of exorbitant fldg and that's that kind of leads to a concentration risk because that's really off balance sheet lending that's happening on somebody else's balance sheet who is not caught by prudential regulation at all and the fact that many lending service providers are contracting the same lending service provider is contracting with tons of other regulated entities so they're promising fldgs to everybody but we don't know if this lending service provider has the capacity to make good on the fldgs that they keep promising out and i think the solution there is not to ban fldg but to regulate it to say that the fldg is uh, proportionate to the risk that the service provider brings if the service provider is actually just following your underwriting criteria and only originating loans for you the fldg need not be very high it could only cover for just operational risks however if the F 
uh, service provider is actually providing an underwriting criteria for you, then you need to see that how much the FLDG needs to be. Also, capital is not the only way to regulate for, let's say, algorithms, right? There is algorithmic accountability, there's auditing of algorithms, there is opening up of algorithms. So FLDG can also be complemented by all those technological implements. And only if you're completely satisfied, you go in and you buy the algorithm or you buy into that contract of using that algorithm on your behalf. And I think another important thing that this uh, system could think of is publishing FLDG. So if you are having an SRO, let it be very clear that LSP1 has promised X cross of FLDG in all 20% to balance sheet lender A, 30% to balance sheet lender B. So that that brings visibility into the system. And it also brings transparency because so many times startups are saying that FLDG itself is becoming a barrier, right? Like NBFCs have a certain threshold of FLDG. They would not talk to you unless you offered that threshold of FLDG. Bigger players are able to get a better deal, so on and so forth. So let there be visibility in the system. Publication of such an FLDG would create competition both on the LSP side, where they can say that, listen, that person is comparable are offering only so much FLDG brings transparency, but also to the regulator, so that if there is any upcoming concentration risk, I mean, COVID was a massive stress on everybody's balance sheets, right? And there was a real worry if the FLDG's promises would be met or not, then you're better prepared for a circumstance like that, because you have clear visibility on how much is riding on the balance sheet of LSPs themselves. I think fair point on uh, FLDG, uh, Benny. I mean, you know, so 20%, 30%. I think in the report, uh, uh, RBI has written, right, there can be an FLDG of what, 15 to 20%, the maximum cap, I think they have mentioned something of that sort. Yeah. But so but the industry, what I hear, so 20, 30% is, I don't know if really a new fintech, they really work on 100% FLDG. So that would be very interesting to see, like if they come out with like, you know, a disclosure, I think disclosure is a very, very uh, fine idea to kind of, you know, say that I have a, this FLDG agreement. But once a person, once a fintech has a 100% FLDG with one NBFC, I don't know whether they'd be allowed to partner with another NBFC with a similar FLDG agreement, right? Uh, so that would be a challenge for most fintechs, I'm sure. I, I think uh, in the FLDG discussion, we are missing this that things in the digital world are changing to everything being dynamic. Like take, for example, your payroll. It has been uh, probably decades old practice that 30 day and all. Now we are in a situation in our digital world where one day, one hour payroll can probably be calculated, right? We're talking about earned wage accesses and all, all things as well. Same thing is happening everywhere. Every data point that used to be static periodic is now becoming like real time 24 seven, right? Everything can be. The same way FLDG or any interest rate, APR, whatever we talk about, is going into that granular level. And this is where probably only algorithms on a broad level can help. And then the uh, uh, RBI or the regulator will have to use automated systems to detect that, hey, there is something that is amiss. This uh, uh, NDFC should have been having this much coming in, this much going out as security deposit and all. Because if you try to put a cap, which is again arbitrary or uh, unfair because there are so many dimensions of it, right? If you even just take an example of an FLDG discussion, which a fintech has, there is, okay, what kind of customer you are lending to? Uh, what is the type of loan product? What interest you are charging? What are the data exchange and all that is happening, right? There's so many dimensions to it. Uh, I, again, I'm not the best person from a finance background to comment on the FLDG. But just, just to look at that, if you put a cap saying that, oh, no, 10 is less or more, uh, it's very difficult to comment because uh, when, when a fintech is coming and, and, and maybe starting, as you said, Aarti, that if, if there are new age fintechs, the NBFC would say, no, we want probably the whole risk uh, or a major part of the risk on you because uh, we don't trust your model. Maybe for, for the initial 10% 10 per, 10 of their business, it is good. And then they can switch on. And this is where I like Benny's point, where I think if the NBFCs themselves publish that our balance sheet X percent was on FLDG mechanism on a whole, on a real time basis, that could provide a visibility into their financial uh, strength in that sense, right? Uh, that, okay, they are already doing this kind of a lending where they are securing probably X percent of their loan on an FLDG mode. And that could also bring competition, which was a very interesting aspect of that. 
the other thing is on the APR side. I'll give you an example. We used to start with Udhar and say that, okay, we will do probably, uh, and, and we used to quote examples that uh, there is a money lender in a hometown uh, who takes 10% uh, a day, which is like the, the vegetable seller comes in the morning, borrows 100 rupees, the standard story which you have heard too many times now, uh, and then pays 110 in the evening. Fintech in India was born to solve this problem. That okay, instead of 100, that person probably 110, that person probably should be paying only 101 rupees, 102 rupees. Because if you look at in terms of APR, that becomes like insane amount, 10 rupees or 10% a day into 365 into IRR, or whatever you do. But if you look at the physical significance of it, there used to be no processing fee, right? If today a bank is providing you check, go into your net banking account, check your loan options, there'll be only five options. So 12 uh, month, 15 month, uh, 24 month, 60 month loan, processing fees 2%. And that loan is like, you would not even want to take that because the processing fee amount is so huge, though the APR is kept under 35. And the tenure is so long that the effective interest that you are paying is very huge, though you just wanted the money probably for five days, right? And this is where even if you are paying 100 rupees for that 10,000 rupees or whatever ratio we can come in, it probably would be better than that bank loan. So talking in front of just capping the APR, like Google had this regulation saying that there cannot be more than 36% APR loan apps, which we will not allow. Or today they have a regulation where they say that less than 60 day loan we will not allow as a product. Now, I fail to understand like the whole Indian industry was trying to solve this one day problem loan that okay, the person can repay and there's two charge that will be efficient. How are we supposed to solve that? If Google, which obviously controls the whole uh, market that we are cat catering to, uh, comes up with this, the industry says nothing, RBI has nothing, and R it's acting as a pseudo regulator on top of RBI. And there's no concern being raised from the industry. So these are the problems that are coming from the fintech side. Again, you could look at it and say, oh, this company is charging so much, but you have to look into all the dimensions, but though the APR could be very low, the processing fees are very high. In other cases, APR is kept in control. The processing review becomes anything. Like I think in the Chinese loan scam, also this thing happened that you requested for thousand, you got eight hundred. Maybe the interest rate is only ten percent, but actually one fifty was the processing fee, right, uh, for processing that loan, and that is taken up front. And there's probably I don't know what exact regulation falls in that place that can the processing fee be, be very high or different types of other fees can be levied or not. Even the case of penalty on loans, right. So today there's a major bank which has a pay later account and it says that uh, if you default on a 15, 20 day uh, uh, loan that they are providing pay later loan, they're going to charge 250 rupees flat. Now, if it's a, even a hundred rupee loan, someone has taken and used once, they're going to get late penalty of 250. And this is obviously, this is not being written in every transaction like we wanted in a fact of a statement of fact for the loan. Now the consumer is like, okay, I just missed it hundred rupees. Will there my penalty be even 250? That's insane, right? So the rationalization has to happen on some other front. We are completely missing the consumer uh, awareness perspective and then the RBI regulation side. Uh, but but if you try to cap the anything, there will be people. So it's like that uh, FinTech say that they are playing the cat and mouse game with their borrowers because borrowers will try to outsmart and some people will default. Here it's like a regulator always has to play the cat and mouse game with innovators. They will always be behind to be very fair, right? Because innovation will be ahead. Regulation will catch up later and there will be issues that happen. You don't want that to happen at human cost. That is the whole agenda. But I, I just, I know Shrikant, we are running out of time, but I really want to uh, put one, one point here. So on the APR part, as you said, and in the PC financial case, just we're taking that as one, one example, more than the in interest, I think majority of their profit, I would say, you know, the bottom line came from penalty and uh, this, uh, uh, the processing fees, right? So, you know, asking for too much of disclosure from the regulated entities, of course, we should ask because they are regulated and they should be uh, held, right, responsible for many of the things. But at the same time, we need to ask for disclosures from the fintech. They just can't go like away with everything and anything just because they are innovators in the name of innovation, right? My personal opinion. And, you know, to just from the customer protection side, I think APR 
is something which i think more than paying that you know paying back the dues i think customers are really pissed and they feel more cheated when they see that you know they have took just 500 rupee loan and they are paying 5000 rupees right i think that's where they feel cheated and that's where they kind of say that you know i'll better default because they are literally i'm harassed that way so even fintech should come up with a proper disclosures on you know this is the time period if you don't pay apr should be made very very simple and of course that also comes under consumer awareness that apr should be made very simple and very clear on day one that this is the money that you have to pay even after five days if you don't pay this is the penalty that we are going to charge you so these are some of the things and fintech should come up with lot and lot like more disclosures because they are the they are the you know front they are the front end right nbfc is the back end so customers are actually interacting with you and not really nbfcs so we should demand more disclosures from the innovators as well. They just can't say that, you know, RBI is not doing a job and NBFCs are like, you know, uh, they are uh, taking too much of FLDG. I think... Uh, Aarti, I think, so disclosure to the consumer is obviously a need that every fintech should be doing. But right. if you are asking for a disclosure on every platform, like Google Pay disclose and then disclose it to RBI, and then when it's so much dynamic, right? It's 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 uh, uh, where where we are trying to innovate and keep all these variables which were static and making it dynamic. It, it is very difficult, right? No, of so course, to the customer. Consumer course, is a different consumer. problem, right? So we have yeah. to be we have to be uh, se separating this. Take an example of a credit card, right? You know this uh, minimum late uh, uh, minimum due, right? A simple word creates so much of issue and it has prevailed for industry long because I think if they just change this term minimum due to that, okay, this is, if you pay the minimum due, there's actually penalty attached to it. People are not clear. I was talking even to like the well-educated tech savvy persons and they're like, oh, I have to only pay minimum due. They've just taken the credit card and they're not aware that they don't have to pay the minimum due. It's the total balance that they have to pay. Just because that term is still allowed, no consumer protection agency has raised an eyebrow or there's no proper forum to do that it has persisted and credit card is such established industry i i don't know how much of the penalties or the late interest will go down if, if that term is just changed into something meaningful for the customer so the same thing happens in loan ways and obviously we need a way where uh, the there are two things one is rbi being able to monitor all of this in an automated manner the second consumer being able to raise this uh, freely and not be like that uh, traffic or the police wala thing where it's like, hey, the police says, this is not my jurisdiction. You go to another uh, place where this happened with you. It should be one central point where the customer says, hey, this is my problem. You have it redirect. Like the consumer helpline probably is doing that. But again, I think there are problems and that's why probably all these problems are not being uh, coming in front of the regulator and it's taking delay. Because if there are so many consumers, people face problem, they are today very ready to uh, complain on social media, why would they not complain on a, a user-friendly consumer health line? They will, and then that will become a pathway to address these issues that, okay, we don't think this is the right way this fintech is doing, they can frame regulation, and they'll be always aware because what goes inside, today what's happening is, uh, previously it used to be the advertising TV screens, right? Everyone could see this is the ad that is coming, but today your ad is far more personal on your mobile screen. And it, it might be very cumbersome to ask RBI to monitor what kind of ad you are seeing because I have seen loan apps using Modiji's banner image, India image, whatnot to uh, market and all those spammy apps doing that as well. But if the consumer knew that I can report this and this goes to the, uh, the relevant authority, then there will be more empowerment that is happening on the consumer. Uh, I, yeah, yeah, I think we have really run out of time and I'll uh, thank all the panelists and the viewers to join this evening uh, and I'll like to say that uh, as part of digital lending watchtower we'll be having more set of conversations around digital lending practices uh, and various issues on on this topic to kind of do uh, some market monitoring uh, by consumers and to kind of see uh, if we can build up uh, sufficient uh, literature around uh, consumer protection issues uh, over a period of time and uh, 
with that i'll like to make a small announcement uh, we'll, we'll probably have the next session uh, next month and this would be uh, a tear down of uh, one of those uh, technical glitches slash scam around the bharat financial uh, consent uh, which was uh, uh, got out by a whistleblower claim and we'll be having that conversation uh, and we'll kind of go into details of what happened there uh, so we'll like uh, all of you to join us for that and with that i'd like to thank all the panelists again and viewers uh, for joining us uh, thanks bye Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shrikant. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you, Benny. Yeah. Bye. This was great. Thank you.